God is good. God is good. Amen. If there's anyone in the Bible who get bad rap, other than Judas Iscariot, might be Martha. I know you heard many, many sermons about Martha and Mary. How often have you heard, be like Mary, not, not like Martha. Yet, I want, I want to, just want to, often we have, we heard about things, we know about things, yet we often miss what God is saying. We are going through the Gospel of Luke, section by section, every whole Gospel. We want to see, we want to encounter our Lord Jesus Christ. We are, probably this is 39th message on Luke. We are not even halfway through yet. Hopefully Jesus will come back before we finish Luke. Okay. Today's passage is from Luke chapter 10, verse 38 through 42. Can you all stand? Let's all stand. Let's read the word of God together. You can follow along in the screen up there, which is ESV. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered the village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone. Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, good part, which will not be taken away from her. Here ends the reading of the word of God. I will all God's people say, Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Thank you. Last week, Ian did such a good job of reading. I was tempted to have you have him come up and read again. And I know you have heard many, many sermons and even teachings. There are many articles and books about Mary and Martha in the Bible. This Mary and Martha are one of the very well, the most well-known sisters in the Bible. Mary and Martha who lived near Bethany, in Bethany, which is a couple miles away from Jerusalem, which is on the way to Jericho, that they had a famous brother who died, who Jesus resurrected, in a, 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 his name being Lazarus, okay. And Bethany was a place when Jesus was on a journey, when he's near, anywhere nearby, he would love to come and stay at the house. So therefore, there are many Churches named their churches Bethany, place where Jesus loved to stay. Anyhow, so we want to look at the story, which we know well. We heard it many times. I want, you to, I want us to look at what God is saying through here. Now, well, I want to do one thing that probably have never thought about. Here's the thing. Every time when the gospel was written and given to us, there's so many miracles and teachings Jesus has done. Gospel, Apostle John says, if you have to write everything down, you know, the whole world can even, you know, uh, contain it. Meaning every author, every gospel had to pick and choose certain things to be left in the gospel. And also, the way they was arranged was led by the Spirit of God in a certain way. The way the passage was, certain things were happening, certain things were remain in the story is important to understand. Now, why am I saying this? Because this is important. Right before this story, what happened last week, we looked at how Jesus was asked by, asked by this expert of the law, lawyer, testing Jesus with the question. The question was, he said, what must I do to inherit the eternal life? What must I do to inherit eternal life? To do that, Jesus said, what does the law say? What, how do you read? And he said, he gave a good answer. Love the Lord your God with all your hearts, with all your soul, with your all, all mind, with all your strength. And second is like, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, do this and you will live. And the guy being convicted of his heart, and he wanted to justify himself, said, 
Who is my neighbor? And then Jesus told the amazing, beautiful, glorious parable about the Good Samaritan. You know about this. Now, after that, sto- after that account, here's a story about Mary, Mary and Martha here. You have to see why this was here. When other gospels do not mention anywhere else. And right after this story, this account is Jesus' is teaching on prayer. Disciples ask, this disciple uh, teach us to pray. Jesus begins to teach about prayer. So you have to understand why is this story was given to us. You have to see this in context to understand what God is saying to us. I want us to encounter God in this passage. Okay? That's for the little background, okay? God is good? All right. One of the first things I noticed in this passage is this phrase. I didn't realize this. I love the phrase, she, Martha, welcomed him into her house. Martha welcomed Jesus into her house. And I just, just, somehow that phrase didn't really hit me until now. You know, it's, you know it's, maybe because I'm thinking of a house church all the time. But she welcomed him into her house. Probably means that she's probably the oldest of the three. She was the mistress of the house. And she welcomed her, welcomed Jesus and his disciples. You don't know how many came into her house. Welcomed him into her house. The Greek word is hypodekomai, which means receive, welcome, entertain a guest. The same word is used when Zacchaeus in chapter 18 of Luke, 19 of Luke, when Zacchaeus, she said, I saw him as a come down, I need to stay at your house. And he, Zacchaeus, welcomed Jesus into his house. And so this is also, that same word is also used when Rahab, the harlot, welcomed the, the, the spies. Remember? Spies? Israelite spies in, in, in the house. That welcome is a powerful word. And the Bible speaks about how hospitality Welcoming a person, a stranger, is a virtue, a good thing you can do. So she welcomed them into her house. I don't know what happened. Maybe she was walking down the market and saw disciples and Jesus coming. Jesus, come and stay in my house. Maybe that's what happened. I don't know. I'm making it up, okay? Okay. Before we go on, I need to, I need to do a little PR. If you are not watching Chosen series, I need to speak to you, Okay. It's season three is now almost over. I think next, I think next week, in a week or so, the final episode seven and eight will be happening. You should be watching Chosen series. It's not the Bible, but it is probably one of the best things I've ever seen that really illustrates and speaks about Jesus and the gospel. Good stuff. Okay, let me go on. And it says, now as they went on their way, Jesus entered the village and a woman named Martha welcomed them into a house. Right? And then there's another person in the story is Mary. Martha welcomed him into her house. We don't know how many they came. We do not know. Maybe Jesus and all the disciples, 12 of them came. This hungry man who walked all day long, maybe. Maybe half of the disciples are with Jesus. Half were maybe on another mission or something. We do not know. But think about, you know, a quarterback of a team and his whole offensive line coming into your house. Hungry, okay? They're hungry. They walk all day long. They come. Jesus is Jesus, Jesus, into your house. Now, another person in the house was Mary. Next verse, it said, Mary was seated at the feet of Jesus. At the feet of Jesus. I, I, just, I, want, I, just, I wanted to stop here. Right? Seated at the feet of Jesus. When you think about this story about Mary and Martha, I didn't, I, I didn't really, this phrase didn't really, Hit me until, until I studied the passage again. I have preached many times, but I have, not, I have not really seen this as much at the feet of Jesus. Why? He's saying, you know, probably in the mobile, maybe in the middle of the house, maybe the so maybe courtyard, whatever, if the house is a little bigger, they're sitting down, Jesus is not sitting and teaching, and people are gathered around, and Mary is seated at the feet of Jesus. Why is this important? Many scholars who say that praise at the feet of somebody is a special praise to say a disciple of somebody. Disciple of somebody. 
This is why Bible will say, you know, New Testament will say, Peter, uh, Paul says, I was taught at the feet of Gamaliel, at the feet, okay? So that here, this is important. Often I haven't see, didn't see it. In those days, rabbis would not let women be part of his disciples. Were not. They were not. And there is actually a saying. It says, may the word of Torah, the Bible, be burned. They, you know, should, they should not be handed over to women. May the words of Torah be burned. They should not be hand, handed over to the woman. This is some of the sayings those were saying in those days. Women are allowed, were not taught. They were not, they were not given to handle the word of God at all. But yet, Jesus let her sit at the feet of Jesus. Like one of the disciples. Okay? This was not the place of woman at all. This was not a woman's place in those days. So she is sitting at the feet of Jesus. Also, also so humility. At the feet of serious of some, somebody's feet, in humility, but also speak that she is a student and follower of Jesus Christ. You know, and probably the Mary was thinking, Mary, the mistress of the house, she's working and doing all that. Probably she's thinking, that's not your place. That's not woman's place, especially when there needs to be work to be done. Woman's place is in the kitchen. Woman's place is not there. Woman's place is not there. When there's need, you should be preparing for the guest. Because that's what Mary was doing. Martha was, I'm sorry, Martha was doing. Mary was seated at the feet of Jesus. Now, let's go back to Martha. It says, Martha was distracted by much serving. You can, see, you can, you can imagine, right, this, all these people. Probably that day, she was only planning to cook for three or four people. Three or four people, you know, her family, one not, her brothers and sister, whatever it might be. Now there's a whole group of hungry men here with them. Now she's busy cooking and preparing everything else. More than that, Jesus is here. I want to do something special for Jesus. I don't know about you. You know how many times, you don't know how many times I get yelled at by my wife. I've been married 37 years. When, when the early days of marriage, I was so bad. My wife will tell me, I, I found it in the bulletin today that people are coming over to our house. Today I just found it in the bulletin. At 2 o'clock, I'm finding that people are coming to our house. Who is cooking? You? And she's be upset. You know what I mean? For my, my wife, when, when guests come, it takes weeks to get ready. She makes sure everything is taken away. Everything away. She says, get those shoes away. Get those cl everything away. She has to clean everything, and she has menu in mind. And that morning, be that before the de people come in the evening, she already have things ready on the table. She has everything ready. That's my wife. You know, and she never does anything halfway. She always does good. Thus, the reason why we are saying no dinner is provided this living life Bible study. Okay. Now I think there will be food. Some there will be some food, but it's just that last time. I said it, and it's like, who's going to cook? My wife said, who's going to cook? You? No. You didn't even ask me. But she cooked. So a whole week long, Tuesday to Saturday, Sunday, she think, she's thinking about what to prepare. You know, Sunday, Monday morning, when, when, you go, when I go to the morning, she'll come, she'll set the tables for Monday night Bible study. And she'll prepare everything. She doesn't want to do the same thing twice. Everything has to be different. And, and so, either we had some pizza nice with Nabba, but she cooked. And so, I cannot do that. Just, she's not take, taking the crust anymore. Unless somebody's going to willing to come and help me out, we cannot do that. So, anyhow, I took the point to say that Mary is trying to really uh, show hospitality to Jesus. She loves Jesus. Her Lord, and she wants to care for him, and she was, she's doing everything. And she's preparing and cooking. And Mary is doing the job of entertaining Jesus and the disciples. She's doing that. Now, she, after a while, she is distracted. The word is, word is Paris, Paris, Pao. Be pulled away or dragged away. So the idea is she wants to sit there too. She wants to listen to what Jesus teaches. 
but she now she is doing everything to prepare and everything. Now you can see what's happening. She's brooding inside. Okay, I want to be there too. But look, and she walks in, maybe bring some hors d'oeuvres. She to see Mary plopping down, eating, chomping down, whatever. And, and she is brooding inside and angry and frustrated. I'm doing all the work and she's sitting over there. And so this is, you know, so she was distracted, much serving. Somebody has to do it, right? Resentment and indignation, Martha, you can, you can feel that. The verb, the verb here is imperfect, that's meaning it was continuing on. She's now brooding, she's disturbed, she's distracted. How often do we do this? Now somebody said this, you have Jesus in your house. You want to be doing dishes? You want to be there cooking? Jesus is in your house. Is that what you want to do? Think about it. Yes. Yes, I want to, I want to show hospitality to Jesus, but Jesus at your house. Is that, what I, is that what I want to do? Be cooking and doing dishes? No, I want to be sitting at his feet. Food can wait. We don't have to have extra special thing. What, could he just, come on. I don't want to be cooking. And when he is in my house, I want to sit and listen to what he's teaching, what he's doing. That, but she is doing all this. And Martha also wished to hear Jesus, but was prevented from doing so by the pressure of providing hospitality. So she comes, you can see, you know, after a while she walks in, Jesus is teaching with the disciples and everybody else, and she comes in, Lord, do you not care that my sister had, had left me alone to serve alone? You see, that, you see that bitterness in there? Jesus, don't you care? She left me, and, the, and I am serving alone. Why don't you tell her to help me to serve? Now she tells Jesus, tell her. She commands Jesus, tell her to tell, help me. That's rude. Right? You see how angry she was. Okay? Sometimes it happens. In the name of serving, I'm serving, working hard and doing things, and, and you know, I'm tired, and I see somebody else, that person is not doing something. And we get upset. Why aren't they doing something? Come on, help! Doesn't this happen? To you? Doesn't this happen? I think my wife must happen to my wife all the time. So I am not good at this. Her love language is acts of service. My, my love language is physical touch. Okay? Words of affirmation. So we do not match. And she feels loved when I help, help and do something. And I'm not, I'm not good in that thing. Anyway. <laughs> let me move on. Okay. So look at what he said. Now look at what Jesus says. She interrupted the teaching. Not only she was rude. What, what, what would Jesus do here? Look at this. He says, Martha, Martha. See, this is why, you know, often we have to use our measure. Of how is he saying this? Martha, Martha. We just saying, Martha, Martha. What is he saying? And you know, it's a thing I didn't really connect with this. There are about 15 times in the Bible some people are addressed by name twice. Abram, Abraham. Absalom, Absalom. Saul, Saul. Okay? Those, when you say those two like, like that, it means it's really sign of endearment. Special love for the person. Intimacy. This is why when these people at the end come, Lord, Lord, did you not cast out demons in your name? They go, don't, don't he know you? I never knew you, Jesus said. But here, when he said, Martha, Martha, you have to hear the tenderness in his voice. He's not angry at her. He's not upset at her. He's not saying, you are bad. No, not. He loves her. She's not doing anything wrong. She, he loves her and says, Lord answered, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. Many things. You are worried about many, troubled about many things. 
and the verse in the Bible comes to me. Just when, I was, when you're worshiping, there's a good praise. I love the worship today. Such a good praise. It's, oh, my, I felt his, it's just, I felt his intimacy and grace here. So good. Now, there's a verse that came to my mind. Jesus said, all of you who are weary and heavy burdened, come in unto me. I will give you rest. Are you tired and weary? Come. I'll give you rest. Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you are worried, anxious, and troubled about many things. Are you? Remember that verse, the promise in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 or 7? Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Just Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and, and troubled about many things. But then he says, one thing is necessary, but I like the way NIV puts it. But, but few things are needed or indeed only one. Jesus says here, you know, you know, it's like few things, few things are ne- but few things are needed, but one is important. Here, Jesus said, one thing is necessary. Jesus is not saying your serving is bad. No, these are these are good things, this is okay. But one thing is necessary. There are a lot of things that you know it's good, which are, may not be necessary. One thing is necessary, Jesus said. And by the, then Jesus said, but Mary has chosen the good portion, good part, or better thing, better. What is better? And he say, he's not saying, Mary, Martha, you did wrong. No, he's saying, Mary chose what is better. Let, let me put things here. Remember I talked, the reason Jesus, this story is here right after the, uh, the summer of Good Samaritan. Par- par- parable of the Good Samaritan, and also it before, uh, in chapter 10 of Luke, because Good Samaritan ended by saying, go and do likewise. It's about doing. Here, Jesus is really getting at, yes, doing is great, important. That's what we are, we are called to this uh, priority. You know, loving our neighbors, and that's important. But what is the greatest command? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and strength. Out of that, you'll be able to love your neighbor as yourself. Here, Jesus says, no, you are anxious about many things. But here, Mary chose the good part. Think about Mary. She, she knows the expectation. The woman should help, be helped with serving one another. She could feel her sister, you know, you know, that laser eyes right behind her. She can feel it. But she chose, I want to be here. I want to sit before Jesus. I want to listen to the word. When am I going to hear his word again? I want to be here, sit before him, and listen to his word. Listening to his word, sitting in his feet was more important than for, more important priority for her than other things. That's what she chose. Jesus saying, she chose a good portion. Few things, are, few things are needed, but one thing is necessary. Here, Jesus says, saying, here, Mary is, and the shield, they will not be taken from her. And you, know, and you, could, you could see a disciple thing, thinking, oh, maybe Jesus will say, yeah, Mary, why don't you help your sister? There's nothing wrong with that. You know, well, help us. You know, she probably, she needs some help. Easy to easy to do that, but Jesus didn't do it. Why? Remember this, how often Jesus said, who are my mother and my brothers and sisters? Those who listen and obey the word of God, right? Remember that? He always said, you know, and then he said, those, you know, before I follow, can I bury my, my father? Jesus said, no. Those who look back, and, and, and while you're plowing, those who look back, you are not fit to be my disciples. Jesus saying, giving, always giving that all, all, utter higher priority of his presence and need, 
seeking God and being near. Not diminishing any way about serving and working. Or well, not, those are important. But here, Jesus is employing, inviting her into this. He's, a, he, he's not saying, you are wrong, he's, oh, she's better. This is how we often ended the messages. Be like Mary. I think that, that the, really, the, I mean, the point is not that. I want to see how um, the Christ wasn't exalting Mary over of a sister or any of us. Rather, he was inviting Martha to be at peace. He wasn't saying, Mary is better than you, Martha. He's saying he's inviting Martha to have peace in his presence as well. Does it, does it, does it make sense? Now, um, now, so let me say a few more things, and I want to close. So what's the point of the whole point of this story? Now, I want to, let, me, let me go back and look at a few things as, you, as I answer the question. I remember in the early part of Jesus' ministry, like Mark 1, Jesus ministered all night, late at night, until late at night, preaching the gospel, healing the sick, casting out demons. You know what he did next morning, early in the morning, before the sun rose? He went out to quiet places to spend time with the Father. Why? Because he, he didn't have enough power? Why? Because he needed some strategies? No. He, in the midst of all the things, he took time to be with the Father. Fellowship communion. Remember when Jesus called the disciples in, in Mark, Mark's version, chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, when he prepared all night and called those whom he wanted to be his disciples, you know what Jesus said? You know what the Bible says? That they, he chose them so that they may be with him. And then he can send them out. First, first job, first thing he's calling us to be is to be with him. To be near him. It's so dangerous when we are so busy doing things in the name of God for God. And we neglect or we, off, we are off balance about our intimate relationship with him. We become somebody who runs and runs and forget why we are doing things. We become machines rather than one in relationship with him. Before, let, let, let me make, ask a question. You know why we stand and praise God when he raised in and praise? Olden days, everybody sat, didn't stand up and praise. And the reason we stand up praise is because in about 60s and 70s, worship movement in America changed in the sense that, you know, that we want to participate, we want to we, either we want to participate in our worship. Before, a lot of churches had choirs who sang. Now, as a people of God, we say, you know, we want to worship God together. We want to sing praise. We stand up to honor God and praise. You know why I mention this? Often we do not know why we are standing when we praise. We do not know. We forgot. We do things as a habit. Forgot what it was about. We forgot what it was about. This is what happens when we are so busy about doing, getting things, doing things and getting things done. We forget the most important thing. We are called to be a house of prayer for everyone, for all the nations and people. And one of the things God reminded me was that we are house of prayer, place where we meet God, encounter God. Intimacy with God is one of our, the most important priority. Out of that place, we will hear God's heart. We will hear his heart for the lost and the world. Out of the place of seeing him, knowing his presence, knowing his grace, if because out of that we work. More things are done out of intimacy than anything else. I remember in the beginning of the year, I spent probably a lot, you know, probably a week or so just going through Revelation, the book of Revelation, and, and actually wrote whole Revelation twice in that final two weeks of the year. And, you know, and studied many ways. In one, the, one of the scary places in the Revelation was this. Chapter 2, verse 
uh, uh, two to, 1 to 7, I believe. And this is where the Jesus speaks to the seven churches in Asia Minor. The first church was Ephesus. And this is what he says in, 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 the, in, in Revelation chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. I know we have the verse up there, right? I'm going to read. I don't think I put, oh, I put verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and the one who walks among the seven golden lamps and says this, I know your deeds and your toils and perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men and you put to test those who call themselves apostles and they are not and you found them to be false and you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake, and I have not grown weary. This is a good church who worked hard, very orthodox, they knew what is right, they were had discerning spirit enough to know where the false apostles comes in, they, were, they endured, they persevered. Look at the next verse, which is scary, powerfully scary. But I have this against you. When God says, I have something against you, Kevin, that's scary, right? When God says, Jason, I have this against you, it's like, what? You want him to say, I love you, I like you. You know, that, okay, okay she does. But you know, anyway, here Jesus says, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. This was a good church who are doing good things. They were doing right things. But Jesus, you have left your first love. You have left your first love. What was that? And I, you know, I, I only, only social media I really do these days is really Facebook, just to see how some of you are doing. That's the reason why I do it. But anyway, I, I come across one of the old pictures I put up, a picture of my wife, you know, when, uh, my wedding day, how beautiful she looked. She's still beautiful, more beautiful now, but she also looked beautiful then as well. Beautiful. Love the picture. I want to say, this is my wife, how beautiful she is. But anyhow, you know when you first loved somebody, when you first fell in love, everything was, you are just floating in the air. You are, you know, you are in the skies, everything, you know. Everything she says is beautiful. She, she cannot do anything wrong. She's beautiful. You know, and I love being next to her, you know, and just holding her hands. I'm in third heaven. You know, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah? Come on, Danny, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, right? Okay. First love. Just, you know, and I didn't marry her so she can cook me a good meal. I didn't marry her so she can make me a lot of money to support me. She still does. But that's not why I married her. I married her because I love her. I want to be with her. God didn't save us, called us just for good works. God called us to be sons and daughters who delight in him, love him. Of course, because we are his sons and daughters, we want to do the things that is in his heart. Yes, but we are called, first of all and most of all, as sons and daughters loved by God. And he delights in us. That's what this picture is telling me about. Yes, work, and all those we need to do is great. But don't forget, it is about our intimacy with him. How, how are you doing this way? How are you doing this way? Vertically with God. How are you doing? Early church. You know, you know remember early church when you know, after Peter's first sermon, thousands got saved. For the next verse, chapter 2, verse 42, the book of Acts says, after there were thousand people came to know Christ, first thing they were doing, it says, they, they were already, you know, devoting themselves to the teaching, right? Apostles teaching, they were devoting themselves to the fellowship. They were devoting themselves to prayer. They were devoting themselves to breaking up the bread. Early church knew from the beginning. Yes, they were called to be witness, but they, they knew what it means to be in God's presence, be the people of God, the church together. I want, to, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to find 
your place bearing again. To really draw near and restore your place in, the, in his presence. I'm going to do a little plug in, okay? Living Life Bible Study. It, you know, I, I tell you, out of all the Bible studies I've done in my life, this is the best one. I love it myself. I enjoyed it everywhere. I want to invite all of you to come. And listening to the word of God was priority for Mary. Okay. I want to invite upperclassmen in high school. Before you go to college, I want you to take, take the class. So you have foundation before you go to college. I want to have a foundation before you go. And, and so I want to invite all of you to come. This coming weekend, we have leaders, leaders hope advance with the leaders retreat with Pastor Lenny. I love that man. That man has been, I mean, this whole month, 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 January has been traveling everywhere to the ministry. I love that man. As he comes, it's so that our leaders, all of us, people who are servants, and we can be encouraged and strengthened, refreshed. Come. Even if you're not a leader, you want to come, talk to Pastor Mimi. Or, or talk to me, and I'll make a special exception. Pastor Mimi, let, let, let them in, or whatever. Okay? Come. Be refreshed and renewed in his presence. Think about what it says. It says this, this person said, there's an invitation from our God to draw near. Where is the place you can go to be alone with him, see his face, hear his voice, know his nearness? Doesn't mean you have to stop what you're doing. Find a place where you can be before him. He's inviting you to come. Just as always, I want to invite anyone needing some prayer, some touch, refreshing touch of our God. I want to invite you to come. We want to pray with you. I want to invite you, even this week, find a place. You behold his face. Draw near. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit of God be upon all those who hear his call to draw near. Be upon all those who call upon the name of Jesus. Be upon Hope Church from now until forever and ever. Amen. Amen.